good. Okay. Yes, welcome everybody to uh, Friday afternoon at the Manor. And I'm John Joseph Masson Gray, I'm the minister at Manor Road United Church. And this this fall weather is isn't it remarkable? It still continues to be warm. It's delightful. And you notice there's another image of me. That's me on my other device. And then if, so the whole, we have a great lineup for this fall, but especially for today. Uh, and you'll hear a bit more about Lisa for Gervais, but I will say Lisa and I, uh, we, share, we, we, we live together, no, on the same street. No, that's about as far as we live together. And she has a lovely cat and it's quite a beautiful cat. What's your cat's name again? Maverick. Maverick, yes. And then uh, uh, Susan Johnson, who was our wonderful idea person who came up with this plan many years ago, maybe two years ago now, and she will introduce uh, Lisa and I'll say over to you, Susan, and what you want to come over at the screen. And... Well, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, our speaker is, as he says, Lisa Gervais, who is the founder of the Red Wing Institute, which is a nature-inspired learning institute. And so I'm willing to, I'm waiting to hear all about this. Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much. Can you, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. All right. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me to speak with your community today. Um, I was thrilled because I haven't done an in-person speaking engagement since uh, March 2020. And so, um, you know, this is the first time I've done something um, live and, and I know it's a hybrid. We're doing live and uh, online today, but I was, uh, when John Joseph gave me the option of doing it live or doing it over technology, I jumped at the chance of actually reconnecting with people because uh, as we know, the pandemic has been very long and isolating. And, um, you know, as human beings, we want to connect with other people uh, in, a, in a live setting. So it's, it's something that, you know, nourishes our soul. So uh, I've said, thank goodness we've had technology to keep us connected during this time and keep us safe. Um, but, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me into your community. Um, a bit about me. So I, um, I used to you know, work in corporate and, and had a professional career and um, that was going along well. And then I stumbled upon an area called positive psychology. And this really engaged me because um, it was about looking at um, people who were really thriving and flourishing. And uh, you know, a lot of the research in psychology is about uh, taking someone who is not doing well and getting them back to what's considered normal. Um, and what positive psychology does is it sort of flips that around and looks at the people who are the most creative, the, the uh, highest performing athletes, the people who are having really thriving and flourishing marriages and, and uh, relationships and, um, you know, doing so well. And what it does is it studies those people to find out what is it that they're doing that we could all be doing uh, to boost our own wellness and well-being. And so um, based on that principle, I founded the Red Wing Institute, which is looking at how we can connect with nature um, and the and the intersections between uh, nature and this uh, psychology and neurosciences research. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm going to talk a bit about how we can tap into nature uh, for a variety of different ways to keep ourselves healthy and thriving and flourishing, uh, especially in these challenging times. So uh, we're gonna be looking at how um, how we can enhance our lives for greater well-being and resilience, uh, how we can be kinder to ourselves uh, in these sort of difficult times and situations, and how we can um, use nature to improve our relationships and our uh, connection. And so, as I said, this is all uh, going to be grounded in um, academic research that's happening all over the world. The, the hot beds of positive psychology is uh, the US, the UK and Australia, uh, but we have a lot of amazing researchers in Canada as well. And uh, I've had the good fortune of connecting with some of those people over the past eight years. So um, we've all heard that spending time in nature is good for us, um, but why is that? So let's unpack 
uh, for a few minutes, why spending time in nature, um, what that does for us. So um, it provides us with opportunities to experience positive emotions. Uh, it can teach us about self-compassion and it can activate um, our strength of curiosity. And so I'm going to uh, delve into all those three. But what I wanna do is I wanna start off with a little activity. We're going to um, divide you up into groups of two um, and online it'll be breakout rooms. And what I want you to each uh, do in groups of two is answer the following question, which is I want you to remember a time when you were in nature and experienced a feeling of awe. So awe is one of the 10 positive emotions. Um, and so I want you to think back, you know, maybe it was when you were on vacation, maybe it was a, an experience you had this past summer. Um, so, you know, it can be from way back or it can be the recent past. Just remember a time when you were in nature and you experienced that feeling of awe. Uh, so let's break the groups out into groups of two. Okay, yeah, that would be great. So, so once you've had an opportunity to think about that experience uh, in nature where you felt awe, I, I want you to each take a few moments to share with the uh, others, you know, what that story was all about. And then we'll have you come back and share with us um, what your story was. Uh, we'll take maybe, maybe they can have three minutes each. Oh, there's something. There's something on the laptop. Uh, it just shows the breakout rooms in progress. Hmm. Yes. Good. What I'm going to do, I'm going to plug in. Are we able to um, send them a message? Sure. So maybe uh, just put the question. So remember a time when you were in nature sure. and experienced a feeling of awe. Here we are. Now you can, Lisa, you can hear me and see me, right? Uh, I can't see you. I can hear you. And I think we're getting feedback. Oh, because you're spotlighted. Right. Okay. I should have unspotlighted you. I wonder if I can unspotlight you. Where do we, where does it go? Sorry. Just the top part. 
Oh. I can see you now. 18 months later, I'm channeling Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. <laughs> I'll close the kitchen door. That's good. Okay. And so when in your life have you experienced a feeling of awe? Correct? Yes, that's the question. So what would you say, John Joseph? When when was the last time you experienced a sense of awe when you were in Oh, Europe? I would say this summer. So tell me a bit about that. When I got my... It, it's still a bit of a reverb, eh? I wonder why. I wonder why it's coming up more than one place. I'm not getting that. <laughs> I'll speak slowly. So there won't be too much reverb. When I got a telescope for my birthday and I was looking at the telescope in the Riverdale Valley and we were viewing the moon and Saturn. And then the eye went to a bit of terror when the skunk came along. It didn't spray us, just took a look at us and we took a look at the skunk and said, thank you. <laughs> the skunk didn't spray us. But um, no, uh, it, it's a real treasure when you can be in nature, even in the city, and see the wonder of the night sky. Yeah, it's fantastic. I have this great app on my phone where I can point my... Uh, my phone up to the sky and it will tell me where all of the planets are and the constellations and you can see them all through this you can you can look at the night sky and then you can also see the constellations through the phone because it's mapping them all for you it's very cool and how how often do people actually take the time to look up at the sky you know we kind of take it for granted not enough definitely not enough no and uh, um, i think i have that same is it is the app called skyview pardon me is the app called skyview yes it is oh good you have, have it the same app yes i yes. think i showed it to you i think you did <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Oh, that, that's how the journey started. The other great part of feeling awe was each time I was near a body of water. And as whimsical as it may seem, even though we live near Lake Ontario, we don't see Lake Ontario. But we were in Napanee and we were fishing and swimming in Hay Bay. We were in Lake, on Lake Erie at Featherstone Point. We were in Port Sydney and there's a lovely river. And we were in Millbrook. And again, there's a, a lovely river and very large pond lake. And so, so I'm curious to know what is it about water that provides a sense of awe for you? I would say, especially in Lake Erie, when I was running beside the lake early in the morning and you could hear the sound of the water that reminded me of the ocean tide. And I almost wonder if it connects with some sort of primordial element within ourselves that we all came from that. The, 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 the ocean way back when. But there's certainly a, a strong connection in that capacity, I would say. Yeah. So, so that's a great segue to what I'm gonna share with the group. 
because there is a researcher that, um, that studies positive emotions such as awe. And what she's found is that when we experience positive emotions, it's kind of like the waves coming and then receding, coming and then receding. So if we have small opportunities throughout our day to build in connection to positive emotions, such as awe, it acts like a wave where they start small, but it builds. And it's actually very um, good for us, both our physical health, as well as our mental health and our emotional health. Oh, I think you're on mute. How do we bring people back? Okay. There's a there's some crazy stuff going on the screen. Sorry. Right there. So should we close all rooms and bring the group back? Should we speak up when we to say we're here? Oh, great! Welcome back. Yep, we're here. All right. So Um, oh. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let's debrief on that. Did each of you have an opportunity to share your experience from nature that brought you a sense of awe? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So who would like to go first and share what was the experience and how it made you feel? Norma? Norma, do you want to go first? I'm just thinking. Yeah, that's what you shared with us about the redwoods. Red, red, the redwoods. Yeah. Well, I was with a friend from teenage years. We were reuniting and that was a nice situation. And I've always loved walking through the woods and the silence. And sometimes you hear the birds. Of course, all the time you hear the birds. You see little squirrely things running around and it's just very delightful. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, the next person, would you like to share with us your, your experience with nature and how it's brought you a sense of the feeling of awe? Well, for me, it was um, five years ago friend and I drove the Blue Ridge Parkway down in the, the southern U.S. Uh, so we were up in the mountains and you know when you're up in the mountains there is nothing but the mountains and the trees and the other growth and it was in the late fall so the colors were turning and it was glorious but the thing is that there was no civilization until you came down off of the mountain and it was like the feeling like this is must, how it must have been before civilization started, before there were people. And I said, you know, this, this, I think this is why they call it God's land. It's, it's, you can feel all creation. Yeah, it's incredible. It's interesting. Forest, forests make me feel that way and mountains certainly make me feel that way. Mm -hmm. and, and our third guest, would you like to share your experience in nature? and your feeling of awe. Is that Betty you're talking to? <laughs> yeah, that's you, Betty. Okay, that's the third. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, this summer, my friend uh, is trying to teach me kayaking, so I'm pretty novice, but we were in a little bay and I was kayaking nicely along when a seven Canada geese decided to land in front of me. Um, <laughs> and I thought, now what is one supposed to do? I don't know the rules for traffic here. Um, <laughs> So I just, I just stopped and I thought, well, I'll just wait. And the, the geese, the seven of them just made a nice line in a straight row straight beside me. So I, gave, I guess they said I could paddle on. So I did. And we just paddled and they swam on to, to the uh, shoreline. It was very sort of feeling in companionship with them and that they accepted me on the water and mm -hmm. I was okay to be there. <laughs> there we are. Yes. 
it's it's amazing how the animals are willing to share their their space with us right because uh some people would think you know it's our space and they're invading but really the animals were here first so yeah that's it's amazing how they're they're uh they're willing to uh you know make room uh as well as go about their daily daily routines so that's fantastic thank you um while you were away john joseph shared with me his experiences um, this past summer with looking up at the night sky through a telescope that he was given for his birthday and you know looking at all the, the wonderful stars and planets and constellations um, and you know how we don't take enough time to to just look up I mean the sky is always there we kind of take it for granted my mother and I were on a road trip recently and um, it was sort of late afternoon and she said, wow, look at the clouds. And it looked like someone had taken uh, a paintbrush and painted these white puffy clouds, but then at the end kind of did a bit of a smear. So the clouds all had these really cool tails attached to them. And it was just a series of these clouds with these tails attached to them. And it was just so magnificent. And we just, you know, we were driving and we were watching these clouds in front of us and just, you know, just fantastic. And it was a beautiful blue sky. Uh, so just a great backdrop for the clouds. Um, the other um, story that John does share with me is all the opportunities he had this summer to connect with water and, you know, how, again, we live on one of the largest bodies of fresh water in the world. Lake Ontario is right in Toronto. And sometimes we don't even think about it, you know, that, that it's so accessible and right there. And we sort of take it for granted. But if you go out, um, you know, on a boat in Lake Ontario, you realize what a vast body of water it is. When you're out there far from the shoreline, it actually feels like you're in the ocean and not just uh, the, a lake. But um, yeah, it's just an incredible feeling of connecting with nature. So thank you for sharing your stories. Those are all great. And, uh, you know, whether it's forests, whether it's mountains, whether it's the animals, whether it's water, you know, the nice thing about nature is it's all around us. So it's always accessible. You don't need special equipment. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, you know, where you are, you always have uh, accessibility to, to nature and tapping into the positive emotions that nature uh, can offer us. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the science around positive emotions. There's a a researcher out of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, by the name of Barbara Fredrickson. And if you haven't heard about this woman, she's amazing. Um, some people in the field call her the grandmother of positive emotions. And her research um, has looked at the 10 positive emotions, which are joy, gratitude, love, amusement, inspiration, pride, hope, interest, serenity and awe and what she's looked at is what what is what happens to us as human beings when we experience po these positive emotions and she's come up with a theory called the broaden and build theory so the broaden and build theory talks about how when we experience these positive emotions it actually broadens our view of the world. It expands our view. And they've even uh, connected it to, you know, how we have peripheral vision. It actually expands our peripheral vision when we are in a state of positive emotion. And it also, not only does it expand, it also builds resilience. So positive emotions buffer us against adversity, against challenging situations like the one that we find ourselves in right now with the pandemic. So this broaden and build theory, she's expanded over her, the course of her research career. And I was sharing with John Joseph when you were in your breakout rooms that uh, she's equated it to, it's almost like a wave that builds as we experience positive emotions. So if we just 
you know, building opportunities throughout our day to experience positive emotions, it has sort of an amplifying effect. And one, one positive emotion builds on the other uh, to keep us um, resilient and, uh, you know, protect us from, you know, adversity and negative feelings. And it, it buffers us. So if you can find opportunities to build in small, you know, it doesn't need to be anything big, like going out to hike a mountain. It can be something small, such as um, there is a researcher in Canada who has looked at um, when we're walking down the street and we just notice the hanging baskets that are hanging off the lamppost or, you know, someone's front garden and just, just noticing the beauty of the flowers and the colors and the textures that gives us a boost of positivity. And so it's, it's easy to do these things. Again, looking up at the night sky, something, it's a micro practice, but if you build in these micro practices, um, you're able to um, create that sense of a building of positive emotions. Um, so we're going to, so that's one way that we can tap into nature to uh, create a sense of well-being, and, you know, during the pandemic, um, you know, you can just be looking out the window and and noticing what the squirrels are doing, and you know that will also give you positive emotions. So uh, I'm going to move on. So so that's one way. The next um, thing that I'm going to uh, share with you, again, it's based in uh, psychology and neuroscience research is this whole idea of self-compassion. Um, so there's a woman by the name of Kristen Neff who studies self-compassion. And um, if we think about our lives, you know, life is messy and uh, things go wrong all the time. And sometimes we beat ourselves up, you know, for, for when things don't go as planned. And so, um, you know, she's looked at how can we use uh, what she calls self-compassion to really embrace imperfection and, you know, be able to adapt to uh, difficult situations. You know, the, the focus of this speaker series is really uh, trying to connect the community around, um, you know, interesting topics, but also, you know, get people connected because the pandemic has been a very isolating time and you know isolation and people living alone was a was a, a you know considered a problem even before the pandemic um the the number of canadians living alone more than doubled in 35 years so from 1981 to 2016 the number of Canadians living alone went from 1.7 million to 4 million people. So that's a lot of people that are, you know, isolated, but, you know, they were able to go out and do social events and connect with, you know, different community members. And so it was okay that people lived alone for, to a certain degree. But with the pandemic, you know, all that was sort of paused for a long time. And so, you know, this is the challenge. In the US, uh, there's also a recent study uh, where people were asked, do you feel like you are no longer close to anyone anymore? And 39% of people said yes. And then in the UK, um, they found that this whole idea of isolation, again, this is pre-pandemic, uh, was so severe. There were so many people in the UK who felt isolated and cut off from their social circles that they uh, appointed a ministry of loneliness to really look at the problem and come up with some solutions for the entire nation. So isolation we know um, is, is um, challenging for people. And it's, you know, we are social animals. Uh, this is how we've survived you know, over the course of- <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's small, but you can see it there. Uh, and so, um, so, you know, we survived because we lived in tribes 
And if you left your tribe and went out on your own, chances are, uh, you know, a dinosaur would get you. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are social creatures. And so this is another reason why the pandemic has been such a challenge. And so um, if we look at self-compassion um, and how we can utilize self-compassion to, to get through uh, something like a pandemic, um, we need to look at, okay, so what does self-compassion really mean? And Kristen Neff's uh, work uh, looks at breaking self-compassion down into three distinct parts. One is self-kindness, two is mindfulness, and three is what she calls common humanity. So I'd like to explore those for a few minutes. And you can think about, uh, I want you to think about a time during the pandemic where uh, you might have been feeling, you know, frustrated or lonely, or um, you know, a sense of, you know, things aren't going well. Um, and then think about how you could reframe that using self-compassion. So self-kindness. Um, that's when I say self-kindness. Uh, what does what comes to mind uh, when I? for that word. You can use the chat if you want to answer the question. So when you think of self-kindness, how can I be kind to myself? Well, is it love yourself? Sure, you can, yeah, it's love yourself. Uh, whether, whether, you, uh, whether things go right or wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so yeah, so it's just being kind to yourself, like, and not beating yourself up verbally when things uh, don't work out well. Um, then mindfulness is about really just noticing in the moment what what you're feeling and what you're going through. Um, and, you know, if it's if it's that you're feeling lonely, that you're feeling frustrated, that you can't, uh, you know, connect with your community, that you can't walk into a store and buy something you have to order things online because that's the safer way to go uh, you know just just notice there, there's nothing wrong with you know having these emotions um whether they're positive emotions or or you know emotions like frustration it's just noticing how you're feeling um but then it's then taking it to the next level and saying okay well so where does the common humanity come in well, we've all heard that we're in this together, right? The pandemic, that's one of the things that um, sort of a, one of the taglines of this pandemic is we're in this together. So the common humanity is, you know, it's okay that I'm feeling frustrated. I'm sure other people are feeling frustrated too. And, and then what can I do about that? How can I, how can I use uh, nature to connect to you know, more positive emotions, or how can I reframe the situation using self-compassion to be able to, to, you know, not say, okay, um, I failed at whatever, um, but thinking more in terms of, you know, I didn't fail, you know, but, you know, the situation didn't work out. Um, it's, it's really just about reframing. And when we are able to think about things in a, in a more positive light, um, that's called a growth mindset. So um, an example would be, an example would be if you wanted to do something uh, and the pandemic was preventing you from doing that, you could get creative and think about, okay, how can I still achieve uh, what it is that I want to do? How is it that I, you know, how can I see my friends, uh, but still stay safe? And one of the reason, uh, one of the uh, options is maybe we meet outdoors and we stay away from each other and we go for a nice walk, um, you know, to the neighborhood park. That way you're still able to achieve your goal of seeing people and staying connected, uh, but also, uh, you know, keeping yourself safe during, during the pandemic. So that's uh, self-compassion. And then the last um, 
area that I want to talk about is how we can tap into our strength of curiosity and how nature enables us to do that. Um, so when, when you think of the word curiosity, uh, what comes to mind? Like, who? Oh, I think you're muted. For me, it's the need to know. Ah, the need to know, yes. And what, what else, what other, um, what other things come to mind when you think of being curious? There, you're unmuted. You can use that. I, I, we've lost your connection. Just tell oh. me we lost your connection. I'm trying to fix it. Oh, will they hear it? Yeah. yeah. Norma has lost the connection and her friend Betty is going to solve the problem. Aha. Uh -huh. But I'm, I'm using her phone. Okay, well, while we wait, how about I share a definition of curiosity? Sure. Uh, so curiosity is the propensity to recognize and seek out new information. So exactly what Susan said, and experiences, including a natural interest in learning and developing one's knowledge. So if you think about it, when, from birth, we're hardwired to be curious. And if you, if you doubt this, just spend an afternoon with a five-year-old, <laughs> you know, because they can't stop asking the question, why? Because they want to know. They're on a mission. They'll drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, somewhere in our journey from you know, youth to adulthood, we, we lose we stop asking these questions. Maybe, maybe people have told us, stop annoying me with all your questions. So we, we <laughs> hold in these questions, but really if we tap into sort of our natural inclinations, uh, we are curious human beings. So Can I stop it? sure. I never lost that <laughs> Do you want to tell us the story about that? Uh, when I was a child, I was very curious. I was still curious. I always asked questions. I always explore. I'm the person in forest school putting my hand. So many times is is the treasure dark. So I never lost that, that desire and any current desire to explore beyond what I can see. Drives my partner crazy. <laughs> you're you're like the five year old. I'm the why. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> why is a really powerful question. Why? What? And how? Has a <laughs> uh, so, so how does curiosity tie back to nature? So if you think about nature facilitates so many different things connected to, to curiosity, such as free play, uh, the opportunity to explore, you know, all of the sensory stimulation that we get by being out in nature, you know, there's, there's plants, there's minerals, there's birds, there's trees, animals, um, all the cycles of the ecosystem, you know, it's like an all you can eat buffet for the senses. Um, and so when uh, we become curious, we begin to ask more questions, just like John Joseph said. And, and how does this connect to our well-being? Well, researchers have found that when we are curious and ask more questions, our relationships improve. Because if we take an interest in someone else, uh, the, both people experience these boosts of positivity again. And if you're curious about someone and you ask them questions, then there's a sharing that's going on between two individuals and that builds connection and community. And so um, we're more likely to share good news with people who ask questions. And by doing so, it helps us capitalize on the positivity. So if something good happens to me and I share it with a friend, we both benefit from that, um, from developing that connection. It, it also enables us 
to navigate and resolve conflict easier when we ask questions versus just jumping to conclusions. So if um, I'll give you a perfect example, I was supposed to be in a wedding this fall and um, it was decided that it would be better for me to attend as a guest uh, instead of being in a, the wedding party. And the reason, you know, it came to light through a series of questions that I just didn't feel comfortable uh, with being in close quarters with the people who are gonna be in the limousine and in the wedding party and doing photos because I've been very careful this whole pandemic about you know, keeping my distance, really staying within a very, very small um, bubble of people. And so um, it was through those series of questions and answers that we came to the conclusion that um, I would be better off and my, my sense of security and safety would be higher if I was sitting at a table with people that I, I'm always, I've been bubbling with this whole pandemic. Um, it, that could have gone very, you know, that could have been a very different conversation if both the bride and I hadn't tapped into our sense of curiosity to sort of get to the root of why I didn't want to be in the wedding party anymore. I mean, it could have been a big problem, but it wasn't because uh, we both respect each other and and she understands now my perspective and I understand her perspective. She just wants to have a beautiful wedding with bridesmaids and, and I just wanted to maintain my, you know, the, what I've been doing all along during this pandemic because I have elderly parents and uh, I just don't want to put anyone at risk. So um, if we are able to tap into uh, the curiosity that nature affords us, that actually is able to get us to, you know, use that muscle and develop that skill of curiosity. And maybe we can go back to our five-year-old selves. So I wanna just wrap up by saying that, uh, you know, nature affords us with many different ways to stay connected, to uh, maintain relationships and to be good to ourselves especially during, you know, these challenging times and uh, winter's coming. So I know a lot of people feel, you know, a sense of isolation even more in the winter. Um, but if you, you know, leverage these things that I've taught you today, and I encourage you also to go explore some of the researchers that I, I shared their names and a bit of their research uh, with you today, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of resources well within your, your control in terms of uh, being able to weather this crazy period that we're living through right now. Um, I know we're going to get on the other side of it. And it's just a matter of uh, keeping ourselves healthy, connected, and safe, um, and being good to ourselves. So thank you. I, I want to wrap up by just giving you a a, a short description of uh, Red Wing Institute. Um, we mostly work with uh, schools and um, corporate teams and community groups. Um, and we used to work with individuals, but we've paused that for uh, last year and for this year. We're starting up our school programs next week. Um, but uh, I'm, I invite you to uh, visit our website. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to start running our nature programs again in 2022. Okay. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'm gonna open up the floor to questions if, um, if that sounds good to you. Great. So turn on your, uh, turn on your camera everybody. And begin to ask you why. Nice tie in to curiosity. <laughs> are there um, are there any sort of like guidelines on your, your web page for your institute uh, ideas of what we could do until things open up again? 
I haven't done that, but that is a good idea, actually. So thank you, Susan. I really appreciate that question. Um, I will give it some thought in terms of um, what I could add. I will tell you that in the winter time, I do run an online program um, around this theme called Huge, which uh, is a is a a word from the Norwegian culture. Uh, mm -hmm. the The closest translation is coziness, and so I I have ran um, this Huge program where once a day for a certain number of days. Uh, you get an e email from me with a hint or tip or activity of how you can bring more huge into your life. And huge is uh, what the people of Denmark use to stay uh, um, happy and healthy and connected during their long winter months. And there's a lot of parallels between their winter experience and the Canadian experience. So uh, that's an option for you. Um, and um, I post things on my social media channels. So we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. And so I have posted um, some information regarding the positive psychology research that I've, that I've shared with you today. So you can, you can follow us on any of those channels. Great. So just to jump in, I think I you also mentioned that it's up to nature. And I know you love uh, nature walks. So I'm just thinking about uh, maybe on your website, you might post what some of the walks have been. And people could do, even in wintertime, I mean, with the advent of all these like, uh, bike trails, but also more pedestrian trails around the city. So you might even know, and there's also the, the K Garden of Belmont. That's right. That's a suggestion. That, that might be something you could recommend, perhaps write recommendations to people of which nature trails are really that work in the winter. Because in the summer, you wouldn't do the rouge that's so good, but you probably be stuck in the ice or something. But there are, there are trails that are groomed. And you might, you might, are there any kind of mind right here? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have, um, during the pandemic, I have been hiking the entire, you know, eight, 18 months has it been. Um, so I organize um, walks with my friends. Uh, so we've gone out to a number of beautiful uh, conservation areas and provincial parks. Uh, and I think that the government is doing a better job of trying to keep as many of those open as possible throughout the winter months uh, to, in order to provide people with the opportunity to get out into nature. Um, you know, you can also, um, you know, just going into, uh, you know, parklands where it's a bit, it's a bit more accessible, uh, like I'm thinking the brickworks, which is also not far from here, they're open um, all season long. And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a just connecting with like your local neighborhood areas is great. But um, there are some trails that they have closed for the winter just because uh, they don't want people slipping and falling on the ice. So yeah, I think you just have to look at the websites to, uh, but I might, I might also take that recommendation and maybe put together a list of areas this winter that would still be accessible. So thank you for that. Are there any other questions? No, okay. So um, I think there's just a few minutes left. Hello, everybody. So I would say I'm, I, my why is, is fired up like no tomorrow. And I think it's been remarkable. And I wonder why that one's highlighted, not the other. But we'll figure that out later on. Why well, know what I did? Oh, we won't wonder. Hold on a sec. We go over here.
And you go to gallery view. There we go. Ah, isn't that better? No, it's been an honor to have you here. And as, as not only my neighbor, but as a person, I, I've always wanted to figure out, we did talk about you leading a group from Manor Road about two years ago. Well, this is your segue into once you get back on the trails and in person, we can do that. 2022. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're, we're so excited and so fired up. So uh, well, back to you, Susan, as our wonderful uh, navigator of, of what we do. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa, and thank you everyone for coming. Next week we have um, Alex, I'm going to mangle his name, Zeritas, who uh, is a great astrologer. He will tell you things about the, about the stars and the planets uh, and just everything you need to know. So he had, he spoke last year, was really well received, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you, Susan. He's our wonderful resident astronomer. And do have a great day. Take care, everybody. Signing off for now.